Travel consideration provided by... Okay, everyone. Our mission is to provide complete balanced nutrition for strength and energy. Yay! Great tasting and sure. With 9 grams of protein, 27 vitamins and minerals, and nutrients to support immune health. You know, this pandemic has really changed the way all of us do business. I mean, I'm doing the show from my garage, but we still like to have fun. So we're going to leave you with a... Happening now. Governor Abbott laying out all the groundwork for retail shops and restaurants to open. We'll tell you what one local business owner has to say. With distance learning the new normal for many, we talked to the city's largest school district about how it's helping students who are finding it difficult to get connected. More than 1,300 calls made to San Antonio police regarding people not following the emergency declaration. I'm Devin Clark. Coming up, we'll tell you the right and wrong way to report it. And as we start a new week, we have a little bit of heat to talk about and some storm chances. I'll be back with that timing coming right up. We're spending a lot more time online and the hackers know it. Coming up, how to protect your personal information and your companies too. Plus, a COVID-19 plasma recipient reunites with his donor for the first time. The News at 5 starts right now. And first at five, the countdown is on. In just four days, all Texas restaurants, retail shops, malls, theaters can finally reopen. Governor Greg Abbott laying out his plans this afternoon on how they can go about it. With the first phase of reopening Texas safely beginning on Friday, our Stephanie Cerna talked to the owner of Chris Madrid's about what that means for his restaurant. Well, hi, ECs. The owner of Chris Madrid's, Richard Peacock, tells us that the timing of the governor's announcement was welcome, and they plan on reopening in a responsible way while practicing social distancing. Now, Governor Abbott said restaurants, retail shops, and movie theaters could open, but with no more than 25% occupancy. Richard Peacock said to open Chris Madrid's, they are going to have to rethink a lot of what they do there because they usually have long lines. So they will look at doing something they've never done in 42 years, and that's to possibly possibly have table side ordering or even have customers order on their phones to keep that social distancing. One rule of thumb, he says, is going to be that his employees will need to be comfortable with having their families and friends come to the restaurant on Friday first, and then if they feel good about it, they will open. We've been planning on reopening for the last several days and trying to take a look at the things that we need to modify in order to feel good about reopening. And so uh, the timing today is welcome because it seems like at first blush at least that this is a very uh, reasoned um, gradual reopening and i think one that the restaurant industry in general is going to applaud and, and can certainly live with and richard peacock will be meeting with his staff today to talk about their plans to reopen and then they're also making a plan on making an announcement later this week possibly on facebook about when chris madrid's will officially open and with all the changes they will have now coming up at six we talked to a local dentist who is also planning on opening his office back up after the governor's announcement ec's Thank you, Stephanie. As more states outline plans to reopen, officials and businesses are still figuring out how to keep patrons from becoming patients. Yeah, this is calls for increased testing grow louder across the country. Karen Kafa brings us the latest from Washington. Karen. Yeah, we saw a handful of state Steve Nieces open their businesses over the weekend and others were watching them very carefully. It was a mixed outcome. Some businesses were too hesitant to open their doors. Others people were just too hesitant to even venture out. It's something that these states and the entire country will be watching as more states loosen up their restrictions. After Georgia's reopening over the weekend, I literally felt the burden being lifted off my shoulders. More states are looking to relaunch their economies. We need money. Colorado, Montana, and Minnesota are among states easing some restrictions this week. In some cases, those decisions clash with data that doesn't yet show a sustained decline in confirmed coronavirus infections as recommended by the White House. In Colorado, cases are rising, but Governor Jared Polis is committing to reopening. We're encouraging that every Colorado who can works from home, and every business that doesn't have to open right away uh, waits uh, a few weeks. Help is on the way for small businesses. Our business dropped 
roughly 50%. Our bank account just got wiped out immediately. Monday marks the first day owners can apply for another round of small business administration loans after a $484 billion package enacted last week flooded cash into the program. As those owners breathe a sigh of relief, medical experts are holding their breath, worried tests are too slow and too few. We have to realize that we have to have a breakthrough innovation and in testing. Right now, you know, we're doing about 1.52 million per week. We probably should get up to twice that as we get into the next several weeks, and I think we will. And testing is the topic of the White House briefing taking place in the Rose Garden right now. The White House spoke with some governors across the country today and also some retail executives about how they will partner with the federal government on ramping up testing capacity across the country. This, of course, has been a big concern for governors as they weigh the economic concerns versus the public health concerns in their states. Stephen, Stephen East is back to you. Thank you, Karen. And I know that Governor Greg Abbott said he talked with Trump earlier today, so I appreciate your reporting. Karen, live from Washington. Thank you. And don't forget, tonight at 6 o'clock, you can hear from Mayor Ron Nuremberg and Judge Nelson Wolf about their exactly. stances on reopening Texas. Meantime, San Antonio police say they have received more than 1,300 calls for social distancing related violations since the city's emergency declaration went into effect. The problem some of those calls came in through 911, which should only be used for emergencies. SAPD is reminding the public that those who do dial 911 for non-emergencies could face penalties because it ties up the department's resources that could be used for pressing matters. On the other hand, SAPD is not telling the public to avoid reporting emergency declaration violations altogether. Um, but we do have the non-emergency number, which is 210207 SAPD. Uh, which we would prefer people to utilize that number. We will have that number on our website, ksat.com, as well as information on how you can keep track of the calls coming in about emergency declaration violations. Now to an ABC News exclusive. Two men connected by an experimental COVID-19 treatment finally meeting for the very first time today. We first told you about Jimmy Hayden two weeks ago when he received a blood transfusion containing COVID-19 antibodies. That treatment made possible by David Herman, a former COVID-19 patient himself. We've been following Hayden's road to recovery since then. Now that he's home, Hayden was able to thank Herman for helping save his life. I don't remember a lot of it, but uh, that timeline on, you know, when I got the plasma and, uh, and uh, to, to turn around like I did and what it, you know, I've done for, for all of them as well and you know to, to finally get some positive news out of all of this and start to turn things around from, uh, spiritually emotionally and all of that uh, was an absolute blessing you can watch more on this meeting in an abc news exclusive report coming up on world news tonight next and tomorrow night it will be on nightline you can also watch our updates with hayden's family during his journey fighting covid 19 right now on ksat.com well, three stories to know today. The Bear County Medical Examiner is working to identify the victims of an apparent triple murder suicide. The bodies were found inside an apartment off Henderson Pass near 281 around 830 this morning. San Antonio police believe a 38 year old woman who had lost custody of her children fatally shot her three year old son, five year old daughter and 68 year old mother before turning the gun on herself. The police were tipped off by the kid's father. They say he had been looking for them and went by the apartment to check on them. He ended up finding their bodies after peeking through a window. None of the victim's names have been released yet. We also now know the name of a 16-year-old boy who died last week after being shot in the head. He has now been identified as Larry Deshaun Jackson. San Antonio police say he was shot while riding in a car Thursday morning near the intersection of Whispering Creek and Argonne Drive on the east side. At last check, no arrests had been made. A 28-year-old woman accused of running over her ex-boyfriend and his new girlfriend now facing a charge of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Police say on Saturday, Crystalline Reyes ran over the woman outside her ex-boyfriend's home after an argument with him. Police say the woman suffered a leg fracture and cut to her head. Though being hit, the man and woman are okay. Reyes is currently out on bond. 
Well, even though they're not in school, keeping track of more than 100 students has gotten somewhat easier for the city's largest school district. After all, they're now online for distance learning. Jesse de Guiado says even so, Northside ISD is actively looking for any gaps in that learning as well as their basic needs. The vast majority of Northside students who once sat at their desks, 92% of them in elementary, middle, and high schools, are now sitting at home on their computers. But what about those who aren't? We're doubling down efforts to connect with them. Did they get an, a device? Can they connect? Are there multiple children in the home and they don't have enough devices? Is Wi-Fi an issue? Yet at times, it's not just the technology they and their families need. Food. Um, assistance with uh, rent or utilities. To find out, communities and schools or teams with Northside ISD make home visits to help those families get what so many need, especially in these very difficult economic times. And if they've not reached out in some distance learning assignments, then there's clearly some barriers that we've got to try to alleviate for the family. By coming to offer them can make all the difference in their lives and their children's education. They're excited. They're they're glad that people are looking for them. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. With more than 22 million people depending on unemployment, mortgage companies have come up with options to help homeowners. In order to figure out which option may be best for you, first you can contact your mortgage servicer, find out if there are fees or interest attached to these plans. Ask about repayment options. They could be anything from a lump sum to an extra amount attached to your monthly payment, adding suspended payments to the end of the loan, or rolling the amount into the balance. Depending on what your loan servicer is offering, you can better determine whether forbearance is right for you. And if you haven't done this already, it's best not to wait and work out a solution as soon as possible. And just a reminder, HEB is extending its hours starting today. All stores will now be open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. The grocery chain had temporarily limited hours to help keep shelves stocked. Most pharmacies, by the way, will continue to operate from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and normal weekend hours. You could read more about how HEB and other grocers have responded to the pandemic right now on our website, ksat.com. And we had a good amount of sunshine around the Alamo City today. Nice day, just a little warm out there. You notice a bit of the heat in the air, but the humidity is really going to make its return here as we get through the evening and overnight tonight. Temperature wise for our weather watchers, Talia and Eagle Pass, her backyard 91, 85 Leon Springs, 90 in Floresville, 91 Universal City, for the most part, upper 80s to right near. 90, 91 in New Braunfels. So as we go through the evening, we will have some increasing clouds, even a slight chance of a thunder shower making its way into town. We'll take a look at the radar, talk about that and our cold front that hits later this week. Coming up, Isis. Thank you, Adam. Well, with more people working from home, your Wi-Fi is working harder and that gives hackers more of an opportunity to steal your personal information. Coming up next, we have 12 on your sides tips to stay cyber safe. But first, let's take a look at how one local teacher is getting creative to stay connected with students. Some pizza, your art supplies. Oh. The students are expecting Thank art supplies, you. so when they see a person standing there with a mask on and a pizza box, they're very confused at the beginning, which is kind of funny. It's Mr. Davis, art teacher. Oh, and, uh, hey. <laughs> about 30 years ago, I used to deliver pizzas, and so I thought, why not deliver them in pizza boxes? So I notified some pizza companies and Domino's, uh, five different restaurants, donated boxes. Is this pizza or art supplies? Well, it's these art supplies. <laughs> it makes me happy just because that they, a lot of kids have been frustrated and let me know that they didn't, you know, when they turn something in, they'll say that all, all I have is this paper to turn it in on. It makes me happy that now they've got some choices. I think it's very great what you're doing. Thank you. I hope this inspires other art teachers maybe to get supplies out to their kids somehow because I know it's very difficult. Some of the kids only have just pencils and, and notebook paper. With so many people working from home and helping kids do schoolwork on the same internet connection, your Wi-Fi is probably working over time. For hackers, that's more opportunity. They're looking for ways to access and steal your personal information or even your company's information. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz with some ways to stay cyber safe. 
This is a lot of us now working from home. Cybersecurity, something your company would normally deal with, now falls on your shoulders. So what can you do to minimize risk of hackers? It starts with your router. One of the most important things you can do is lock down your router by keeping its firmware up to date. When a manufacturer rolls out a firmware update, it often includes a security fix specifically designed to keep hackers out. Instructions on how to update routers vary by brand, but you update most of them through a website or app. Another thing you can do is change the default password on your router and don't share it with the neighbors. The best passwords are long random strings of words with numbers and symbols. If you have trouble remembering all your passwords and who doesn't, consider using a password manager to help you keep track of them. Consumer Reports recently tested several password managers and found one password was the best option. It's also important to keep your antivirus software up to date. And finally, experts recommend enabling two-factor authentication on accounts anytime it's available. It's one more layer of security as you work from home. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. What a great weekend. Oh, it was beautiful, wasn't it? Love oh. the weather. You could tell the heat, though, ramping up yeah, a, little a little bit, bit. on this Monday, Adam. Uh, yeah, and you know, you think back to Friday, 98 degrees. Yeah. That's the hottest day we've had so far this year, and we were just a degree shy of a record that day. You look outside right now, and yeah, it's, it's starting to get that look and feel of spring going into summer, and we know the real heat's just around the corner, but we actually have a little cold front to talk about that's going to affect us this week, so get ready for some changes on the horizon. Let's first start with the radar though. I want to talk about this. We have some activity developing in Mexico and some around the Big Bend area pushing our way. And I do want to point out that some of this could actually make it across the Rio Grande and even toward the I-35 corridor. Now I don't anticipate uh, really a lot of activity out there this evening or tonight, but there is that off chance that one of these could survive and make its way closer to San Antonio. And if we're lucky, we'd get the remnants of it and a little brief splash of rain, little splash of water. But you see most of it right now off to the west, especially in Mexico and a little bit near Langtree Sanderson area as it's headed to the southeast. And it's this little batch right here with the lightning that you see uh, west of Rock Springs. That's what we're going to watch as we go through the next several hours, as it has the potential to hold together through the hill country, affecting possibly Rock Springs, even down into Uvalde. And then we could get the last little gasp of that thunderstorm around anywhere from 10 p.m. to midnight tonight. It could make its way to San Antonio. I'm not expecting anything severe from this, by the way, and it would be fizzling out most likely as it heads here if it actually makes it. It's going to be a toss up with that one. All right, looking ahead then tomorrow, we start the day with low clouds and a bit of a gray sky overall and dampness in terms of humidity. Right now the dew points at 61, air temperature of 89, but the humidity is really going to be ramping up. Air temperatures, they'll be up and down a bit the next several days. Right now we're near 90, 92 in Divine, 87 in Bulverde, comfort your 86 degrees, then you get into the 90s farther west and southwest of San Antonio. 93 Catula and Del Rio, for example. But let's talk about that humidity. Okay, it's been on the rise gradually through the day today. It's still not overly muggy out there. Dew points near and in the lower 60s. So there's a hint of that humidity. But watch as we go through time. Here's our future cast. And by tomorrow morning, oh, we've got those oppressive dew points in the lower 70s. So very sticky. And that's also, I think, going to lead to some areas of fog for the first part of the day tomorrow. Wednesday morning, very sticky as well, but here comes the big change as we get through about the midday hours Wednesday. A cold front's going to hit us. Northerly wind dries us out and will cause some noticeable changes for the latter half of the week here. So notice very muggy tomorrow. Wednesday we see that humidity fall off Thursday and Friday. That nice crisp air before the humidity returns again into the weekend. Now I did mention that cold front that's going to hit on Wednesday. Sometimes they bring with them. Good rain chances. This one, unfortunately, just looks like a 20 to 30% chance. Maybe an isolated pop up storm tomorrow. With that cold front, the first part of the day, Wednesday, we can't rule out some isolated activity, but we would be on the tail end of it, and we're not expecting all that much in terms of rainfall or any storms. So 71 in the morning tomorrow, very muggy. 89 in the afternoon. We'll start to see the sky clearing out throughout the morning and midday and just a 20% chance of a rogue storm popping up tomorrow afternoon. Now we look ahead. There's that cold front. It's going to be a windy Wednesday, but it's going to be a nice breeze out of the north, drying out the air, giving us a lack of humidity. 
and total sunshine Thursday, Friday, upper 80s, near 90, low humidity and some mornings in the 50s by Thursday and Friday. How's that? Oh, looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Adam. Sounds great. Thank you, Adam. All right. You know, the draft went so well last week for the Cowboys. Maybe Jerry should watch most of their games from the yacht. Why not? Because in this particular <laughs> case, they haven't had a better draft since 2005. And when we come back, one of the big moves was actually training up at the fourth round. It was their new head coach, Mike McCarthy, that insisted on that. We'll tell you why coming up and the California training camp for the Cowboys may be out coming up. We've had a good draft. This is uh, wherever we sat, wherever, whatever we did, whatever clothes we had on, maybe we ought to remember that and write them down so that we can do it again. We had a good draft. Yeah, stay on the yacht, right? Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, not the only one who thinks Dallas had a great draft in big board sports. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. In fact, most NFL observers give the Cowboys an A for their picks in the 2020 NFL Draft, not just because Oklahoma wide receiver C.D. Lamb fell under their laps at number 17. It's what the Cowboys did with the rest of their picks, filling holes in their defense brought about by losing players such as Robert Quinn and Byron Jones to free agency. Fill those positions, the Cowboys draft Alabama cornerback Trayvon Diggs in the second round and defensive tackle Neville Gilmore. Gillimore, who, but one of the big moves came when the Cowboys traded up to the fourth round to grab Wisconsin center Tyler Biotis after Travis Frederick announced his retirement. The Cowboys giving credit to their new head coach Mike McCarthy for insisting on that move up. I must uh, say that's where, you know, Mike spoke up big time in terms of uh, uh, wanting to really uh, make sure uh, that that center position uh, you know, that we got great competition for it and we get it right. And I certainly think by does adds that. Uh, as you know, we've got uh, the two Connors that uh, uh, have an opportunity there. We've got Joe Looney. Uh, it's going to be a great battle there for that spot. All right, here's a look at all the Cowboys draft picks. We start with the top four there. You see starting with Lamb and rounding up with Reggie, jo uh, Reggie Robinson the second, and the rest of it looks like this. It also includes Viatas at number four and Ben DiNucci, a quarterback out of James Madison to the seventh. For the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, new Cowboys head coach Mike McCarthy is bringing up the possibility the team may be forced to cancel their plans to hold training camp in California this year and instead at their headquarters in Frisco. McCarthy never made the trip to Oxnard as he had hoped in mid-March due to the coronavirus, did not get to see the layout that has worked so well for the Cowboys since 2012. McCarthy says they have to keep the open up the possibility of both sides with less than three months until camp is scheduled to open. We've done some heavy planning on, you know, first, if, we, if we're able to go to Oxford and then if we're not able to go to Oxford, you know, what's it going to look like, you know, if it's in Frisco. So that that's uh, that's been the starting point looking from training camp back as far as our pre planning. Yeah, and the trouble is the Cowboys are one of the few teams to open up early on July the 21st because they were scheduled to play in the Hall of Fame game on August the 6th. No San Antonio in the discussion? Not yet. Not okay. yet. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. A little bit of activity far to the west of San Antonio, even across the border right now, but we're keeping an eye on it as there's a off chance, about a 20% chance that some of that could make it to San Antonio later tonight, just in the form of a few leftover showers. Otherwise, cold front hits on Wednesday, causing some changes. All right, thank you, Adam, and thanks for watching the News at 5. World News up next. See you.